So welcome everybody. Uh, uh, if you're new to the call, my name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a member of the CCL staff and I'm really happy that I'm hosting today's call. I'm actually talking to you from Washington, DC, where over 800 CCLers will be here on Monday and Tuesday, we'll be on the Hill. We have 472 appointments scheduled as of uh, yesterday. So we will see most of the entire House and Senate on Tuesday, and we're excited about that. Um, all right, what's gonna happen today is I'll be introducing our guests in just a couple of minutes. After we hear from our guests, we're hoping that there's some time for Q&A in, um, uh, in the chat, and then we'll go over some of the things that we're asking you to do from this month's call, go over some of the actions, and then we have something to share with you that uh, I think we're a little bit excited about. So our guest today, uh, Professor Andrew Hoffman from the University of Michigan, uh, has a master's, I mean, excuse me, a bachelor from the University of Massachusetts in science and chemical engineering and a minor in environmental sciences. He has a master's from MIT in civil and environmental engineering and from also MIT, has a doctor of philosophy from the Alfred P. Sloan School of Management and Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Interdepartmental Degree. Uh, I told uh, Professor Hoffman earlier that I made the mistake a couple of weeks ago of hitting uh, print when I was looking over his CV. He's published a lot. <laughs> so we mentioned two of his books on the action sheet, Culture Shapes, the, uh, excuse me, How Culture Shapes the Climate Change Debate and Reengaging with Sustainability in the Anthropocene Era and Institutional Approach. So we're very excited to have um, Professor Hoffman on because he's able to talk about this uh, issue from such broad views. Uh, so Professor Hoffman, uh, I just want to tell you a couple of things about the people you're talking to before we unmute your line. Uh, first of all, these people will probably get more done to do something about climate change than any group of you, people you're ever going to talk to. This year they've published almost 3,000 letters to the editor and almost 500 op-eds. Uh, by the time we get to Tuesday, we will have made over 1,600 visits to members of the House and Senate, so they are very, very busy. But here's the other thing I want you to know about them. They choose to work in a place which is probably the hardest place to work in our country right now, which is the nonpartisan or bipartisan center. They're not interested in whose fault things are. They're not interested in making excuses. They're interested in figuring out how to work with people so we can solve problems, not figure out whose fault it is that we haven't solved anything yet. So I feel very fortunate to work with these people uh, every day and we're very, very happy you are on the call today and welcome Professor Hoffman. Well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm blown away. What an impressive group and, and thank you for inviting me. I hope I can offer something of value to your important work. Um, the way I understand it, I'll talk for 15 minutes or so, open it up for questions and then uh, hopefully something productive comes out of this. Um, so I'm going to do kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall and, and, and see what sticks. Um, just to begin, I approach the climate change issue um, as a cultural issue. Uh, it's, a, it's a change in our values, it's a change in our beliefs. If you think about the core question of climate change as a cultural question, I frame it as, um, do you believe we as a species have grown to such number and our technology is such power that we can alter the global climate? And if you answer yes, you agree with climate change, but you also, you're really uh, saying yes to a fundamental shift in our sense of who we are as a species, what the world is out there and how the two interconnect. And so when I think about climate change, I also think about the broader issue of the Anthropocene. And climate change is just one of the markers of the Anthropocene. Science has described nine planetary boundaries where we are altering the global systems of the earth. I and mean, so it is a, a fundamental shift in some core conceptions. You know, I, I, I get uh, hate mail. I have a folder for hate mail. I suspect maybe some of you do get as well. And, um, it's because this is challenging how people think and how they behave and, and people don't like that, they resist. And so uh, in my work, uh, I've looked at it as, you know, why does climate change have such political baggage? Why is it uh, filtered through a cultural lens? And that's just the values and the issues that get laid on top of it. And so trust in the market, the role of government, belief in God. A lot of people know this is a problem in, in, in their religious beliefs, conceptions of freedom. All these issues come in with the climate change specifically and the Anthropocene more broadly. And so the challenge in communication really is trying to overcome distrust 
And there you start to get into the, the cultural elements of the debate. The messenger is as important as the message. Framing is critical for the audience you're talking to. I'm sure what I'm saying is not new to the people in this audience. And so uh, um, um, I can go deeper in any of those if it's helpful. But the, the shift we're going through uh, in my more recent work is, is as big as the Enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment was a shift from seeing nature as um, animated by mystical forces, uh, um, usually understood through the, the lens of religion. And then the Enlightenment came along in the scientific revolution and we decided we could break it down into its pieces. Uh, the metaphor of a machine, we can start to take it apart and look at the pieces and then reassemble. And I think we're starting to realize that that approach uh, doesn't quite work anymore because we're altering the whole as we tinker with the pieces. And I think some interesting things about the comparison to the Enlightenment, uh, it took a hundred years for the Enlightenment to play out. And many people, when they were in it, didn't know it was happening. That's actually a term that was applied uh, after this big sh shift in our, our cultural consciousness. And so uh, this shift is gonna take us a long time. And uh, I do think there are shifts at play already that are changing our cultural norms, values, and beliefs in ways that are reflected by what's going on in the world around us. And so that's what I focus on. I focus on public opinion, policy, technology, nonprofits, and in particular, I focus on markets and how markets are shifting. That's one interesting difference between the Enlightenment, um, which happened a couple of centuries ago, and what I'm calling the re-Enlightenment we're going through right now is we have the market that's a player in this, both as the cause and ultimately has to be the solution. Uh, uh, the market is the most powerful institution on earth. Uh, Business is the most powerful entity within it. If business isn't solving this problem, it won't get solved. And uh, so that's a, a second dimension of my work. So with that as a preamble, I just wanna go through three things um, that I discussed with Ricky and Mark over that might be uh, helpful for this group. Um, um, the first is public opinion and shifts in public opinion. And there's something very interesting going on right now in the shifts in public opinion. Uh, Yale University does their Six America study. They've done it every year for the past 10 years. And more recently, something's happening. And if you look at uh, their, their surveys, they divide the American public into six categories. And the three categories that are concerned about climate change, the alarm, the concerned, and the cautious groups are growing. And the three groups that are uh, less interested in the issue, the disengaged, the doubtful, and the dismissive are declining. And over the last five years, it's been increased by 11% of those that think it's happening, an increase of 16% of those who are worried. And importantly, when I look at this issue, 11%, an increase in 11% of think it will harm them personally. And I think that's really important. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we could have uh, weather events in Bangladesh and it'll be in the news and we'll feel sad, uh, but change won't really happen. Um, we react when change impacts us and it's, it's happening, it's happening now. And in fact, if you saw the New York Times today, there's a, a, a very um, sobering editorial that scientists have uh, misjudged the pace at which climate change is happening and what they originally thought was gonna be a fringe issue and fringe impact is now hitting us now. And that is changing the debate. When you ask people why are they changing their position on climate change, two issues come up. One, uh, the weird weather we're having. Um, Hurricane Dorian, Harvey, uh, the wildfires in California. Uh, these are things that are happening. People we know, it's happening us, and it's happening now. And that's a shift in the debate. And then secondly, people are becoming more uh, impressed by the arguments that are put out there. And that, I think that's encouraging because people are starting to talk about this. So part of the Yale survey, a question that I've always focused on is, do you talk about climate change with family or friends? And it was pretty flat, steady. 25% of Americans would talk about climate change with family or friends until last year, it jumped up to 40%. So the, the, the debate is engaged. People are talking about it. They're not shying away from it anymore. And that has a power to convince. Um, our objective here is to create a, a social consensus, a social fact, as Emile Durkheim calls it. A social fact is something that you're not afraid to talk to others about because you know we all agree. I mean, cigarettes cause cancer. 
for decades, people didn't accept that. Today they do, it's a social fact. I'm not afraid to say to somebody, you can smoke if you want, but it's really not a good idea. And so the, 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 the context of the debate is changing. I think also important, the partisan divide is narrowing. Um, if you look at the, the, the difference between Republicans and Democrats on this issue, and I, I applaud you for trying to stay in the middle and talk to both sides, that's key. But the opinion polling does show that Democrats have consistently believed in this issue, Republicans not. And there's been a decrease in belief in uh, Republicans till around 2009, 2010. That's the height of the climate gate scandal. And then coming up since then. And right now, the Yale surveys show 68% of liberal to moderate Republicans think this is happening. That's a 14 point jump between 2017 and 2018. And I'll get into a hypothesis on why that's so in a second. The University of Chicago did a survey found that 76% of Republicans want the government to do something, 96% of Democrats, 81% of independents. So that partisan divide narrowing, I think is very important for the politics in this country. Um, and then I think it, uh, another interesting piece of this is the youth movement. Um, uh, one of the problems with environmental issues in general is that it's hard to find a constituency that it represents. Everybody benefits from a clean environment. Opposition to regulation on the environment actually makes more sense because it's threatened material and economic interests. But those who benefit, if we have women's issues, we have women, they're an aggrieved group. If we have labor issues, we have labor, they're an aggrieved group. We now have an aggrieved group on climate change. It's called the youth and that's very powerful. And you know, in academia, we don't believe anything until we have data. <laughs> And we actually had a study that came out in Nature, I think uh, a month or two ago, that actually proved statistically that parents actually do love their children and will listen to them. And so there is a study out there to show that the youth movement is impacting adults, both their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents, and corporations. Corporations got very involved because this is who they're gonna hire. And if you look at the millennial generation, there's two issues they're done with. One is climate change, the other is gay marriage. And so the partisan divide is into almost entirely gone with young people, which is encouraging, but we need to move quickly. So that's the first issue, shifts in public opinion, and it's an exciting time. The second issue I wanna focus on is insurance. Insurance, I think, is very important for this debate. They have no political dog in this fight. They are just looking at numbers. They're looking at risk. They're monetizing the risk. They're passing that risk on to uh, individuals, consumers, corporations, through both the cost of a policy and the coverage of the policy. And things are changing. You can take a look at, at um, data from uh, particularly the reinsurance sector, Munich Re, Swiss Re, steady increase in natural catastrophes over the past three decades, steady increase. But what's more disconcerting for them is the cost. And that is, it, it's got a general upward trend, but it's spiky. And that makes insurance companies very uncomfortable because they don't know how to price. Um, and so 2017 broke a record for natural disaster costs, uh, $330 million in this country. And importantly, 50% of that was insured. 50% of it was uninsured. So um, that is, I think, starting to change the debate. You could look just at wildfires. And between 2000 and 2009, there were less than $10 billion in insured losses from wildfires that whole decade. And then from 2010 to 2018, not even completing this decade, were over $50 billion in insured losses, insured payouts. And so just two months ago, the Society of Actuaries did a survey of underwriters and to their surprise, climate change topped, uh, popped out as the top risk. It displaced cybersecurity, which was always at the top. Now it's climate change is the issue they're worrying about the most. And when you talk about framing climate change, if you talk about the message of being as important as the message, this is key. If you wanna make something salient, put a dollar sign on it. And I would recommend you, the Brookings Institution just did a report, uh, came out earlier this year. And uh, it, uh, the title of it is called Costs and States That Will Get Hit Hardest. I'm sorry, that's not the title. Uh, I can dig you up the title. But one th they, they looked at the economics of it and they did it county by county. And they showed which ones would have uh, costs over the century, and they, uh, some, some counties will actually get benefit up in the northern latitudes. Um, costs in terms of uh, reduced productivity and construction, mortality, uh, storm costs, insurance payouts, and what you'll see is it's all mostly down in the south, in the southeast, Florida is the epicenter, and then they have a very provocative chart on it. They just rank the states by uh, most 
uh, most damage to most benefit. There are some states that will benefit. And then they, they color coded them, though, those that voted for Trump and those that vote, coded, voted for Clinton. And the, the states at the top of the list all voted, almost all voted for Trump. So that's uh, very interesting, again, for starting to shift the debate. The third area I want to focus on is um, the corporate sector. And uh, I find some interesting movement in the corporate sector, not enough, but still some movement. And the way that uh, corporations ha have been thinking about this, uh, just environmental issues in general, the way I've been teaching it is just fit it in with existing market, market logics. So we don't talk about climate change, we talk about consumer demand, operational efficiency, cost of capital, and that'll get you to build a sustainable hotel or create sustainable food or sustainable car. It's just a market shift, just like any other. But that's not solving the problem. Um, the Tesla's a great car, but the answer to climate change is not another car. The answer is shifts in our total mobility system. And so the way things are going in the corporate sector now is trying to think systemically about these problems. And that creates some interesting movement. Instead of reducing carbon, we're now talking about carbon neutrality. Uh, Toyota has a, a goal to go carbon neutral. Marks and Spencer claims they have gone carbon neutral. Uh, the University of Michigan is looking at going carbon neutral. The University of California just announced they will. Even the countries of Costa Rica and Iceland have announced they will go carbon neutral. Um, and then divestment. Uh, is a big part of it. A lot of pressure on the University of Michigan to divest. The president's still hesitant to do it. But if you notice, Norway's sovereign wealth fund, which have, has over a trillion dollars, has divested from oil and gas. Even the Rockefeller's, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, which made the money off of oil, is divesting from oil and gas. Um, uh, ESG factors, uh, uh, environment, um, uh, uh, just the environment on the social and the governance issues. Uh, the intangible aspect, assets of a corporation like reputation, they increasingly drive stock value. Uh, according to UBS, upwards of 80% of stock value now is driven by intangible assets, reputation and things like that. That is pushing corporations to start to think about this very seriously. Think about Tesla. I mean, Tesla right now has a market cap that's greater than General Motors. Uh, that's people looking at the business proposition, uh, the intangible assets as much as the tangible. And uh, I actually recently moderated a panel where a senior executive from Walmart said something that just blew me away. She said, we live in fear of the tweet. This is reputational damage. This is, rep this is what they're most concerned about. And then ESG investing is also driving this. Again, according to UBS, there's over $30 trillion in ESG investing, and it's a 34% increase in the last two years. So that, that does tie in with that divestment question. And then really you could talk about restraints on the market, but then you want to start to think about opening up market segments. How are we going to deal with this? So shift some mobility, not just moving towards electrics, but moving towards um, alternative mobility. We're having bike lanes built here in Ann Arbor. Uh, cities are recognizing that they just, they just can't handle the number of cars that are coming in. And they have to start to think about different ways for people to move around, sharing economies, um, driverless mobility, Let's see how that plays out. Smart homes are starting to really uh, grow as a, as a segment. Uh, alternative protein. Um, Beyond Meat just had a wildly successful IPO this summer. And other players are starting to get into, the, into that market. Uh, cricket farming is starting to grow as a market. Um, I don't know if you're ready to eat crickets, but they do grind it into a protein powder. You can add it to your food. And it's much, more, uh, much less carbon intensive than a steak. Um, and in fact, A.T. Kearney, a management consulting firm, not a, an environmental group, came out with a report earlier this summer that predicted that by 2050, 60% of the meat you eat will have grown, been grown in a lab or um, be vegetable based. So uh, that's, let's see how that plays out. Even things like flight shaming is starting to take off. Um, uh, there was a study done that uh, uh, typically we have about a 3 to 4% growth in flights every year. And flight shaming is causing people to maybe cut that in half. And people are starting to question how much they fly because of the impact on the climate. And uh, a consulting firm did a study and said that this could cost uh, Airbus as much as 2.5 billion euros by the end of this, uh, in the next decade in reduced purchases for flights. It's, uh, it's fascinating. So, so those are the three areas I want to talk about. I want to talk about the idea that this is a, a political issue, this is a cultural issue, 
And I just want to conclude with the way I see this going is that right now, uh, a lot of Republican politicians, their staffers, uh, will say behind closed doors, they know this is real. I'm sure some of you have experienced this as well, but they don't want to come out and say something their fear of their constituency will hammer them. And they look at Bob Inglis as the poster child, come out on climate change, you're gonna lose your job. Even some corporate executives have said that. We had the CEO of Cargill on campus about four years ago. He said, I know climate change is real, but if I say that publicly, then the farmers and ranchers that I work with are gonna hammer me and I can't take that chance. He's since come out. Um, he needed uh, Hank Paulson and the Risky Business uh, Project to get a whole bunch of CEOs to come out en masse and to strengthen numbers. And so I'm wondering whether we're going to start to see maybe a few test it. We're starting to see some defections and some people coming out and saying this is real. We need to invest in nuclear, things like that. But if a few come out and start to realize, hey, I could survive that then more will start to they'll, they'll fall like dominoes. I, I jokingly think to myself that they already have the speech in their top drawer. They're just waiting for the political cover to safely come out and come out of the closet and say, this is real. And so if we can start to get more movement, then you'll start to see a rapid shift in the public debate because again, we've, 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 we, we, we trust the messenger as much as the message. We've become tribal and so, if Republicans hear it from Republicans, if evangelicals hear it from evangelicals, um, then people will start to shift and start to shift really quickly. That's all I have. Um, I'm happy to, to discuss or- Great, what do you want to do? absolutely fantastic, Professor Hoffman. Um, we do have a time to get to a question or two in the chat and I'm gonna mute my line because Ricky's gonna ask the questions. He's been monitoring them, so let me just- Hey, Hey, thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Um, the first question we have is really related to this question of businesses and uh, their responsibility, and really just speaking to a little bit about that, the, the critical role of business and game engagement on climate change and you know, what their associated opportunities are with that. Well, I mean, we could talk about responsibility and you know, the funny thing, now he's on. You know, we teach in business schools, uh, I'm muted by the host, you are unmuted by, okay. Uh, I'm really trying to push in, in, in my teaching to recognize that uh, business leaders, they look at the numbers, but they, they make decisions based on judgment, on character, on wisdom. And so there are a lot of CEOs that are trying to move on this issue and they're trying to push the system around them. So I'm thinking of, for example, Intel. Intel was instrumental in getting the electronic sector to far, start to focus on um, uh, conflict minerals in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's not a climate change issue, but I'm just using that as an example, trying to shift the system. Right now, I'm working with Paul Pullman, who stepped down from Unilever, the CEO of Unilever. He started something called Imagine. And what he wants to do is find sectors where there's tight concentration market power, get that small handful of CEOs in a room and say, okay, let's move on palm oil. Let's move on climate change. Let's just do this. And if we do, we'll get others in the sector to start to follow and it'll make it easier for policy to be set later on. And so that's the level of the conversation that I'm starting to get excited about in the corporate sector of trying to take on a strong role. I do have reservations. Um, um, when I was first talking to Paul about this, my first statement was, we used to have something called government that did this. And he says, yeah, but government's, it's weak now and it's not moving fast enough. And my answer is, what has the corporate sector done to make it that way? Leaving that aside, just a pragmatic approach we got to get more companies out there taking a leadership role and trying to push their sectors to move forward. No more. No more. Fantastic. Professor Hoffman, hold on a second here. Ricky, can you, yeah, um, that was amazing. I'm hoping we can get you back. I think uh, we would love to get more of this and uh, all three topics. I have been wanting somebody from the reinsurance industry on for quite a while. And I just to get a simple question answered, like how do your actuarials do their work now? Yeah. Well, you know, that's an interesting question because um, if you take climate change seriously, which many firms do now, a lot of that actuarial data, which is their bread and butter, is useless. Um, so many insurance companies are, they, they can't throw it all away, but they're going to throw away everything older than 10 years. And then a lot of reinsurance companies are hiring climate scientists because, again, act, past is not prologue. Actuarial data will not help you uh, monetize risk going forward. You need better, better tools and instruments. Yeah, well, fantastic. And again, a lot of the reason that we argue for a price on carbon is for exactly what you're saying is to just try to give the little bit extra of incentive throughout the entire economy 
to say transitioning is going to be a great, a huge economic benefit to a lot of people. But I would, I would yeah, it, it, a, a price on carbon is key, but it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything. Um, I like to use the example in Ireland, they passed a plastic bag tax, 13, 13 cent tax, and plastic bag use dropped by about 98%. And economists stood up and said, hey, pricing works. And I said, well, wait a minute, time out. Um, there are contextual factors that make that possible. Um, uh, in Ireland, um, there was a social norm that got set that if you were seen carrying a plastic bag, you're seen as a jerk, like someone who doesn't curb their dog. And, and a, a price alone, it depends on how the price is institu instituted. So if we had a spike in the price of gasoline, the market responds, people buy uh, more fuel efficient cars, they drive less. If that spike is caused by a jump in the federal uh, um, uh, gas tax, the response is going to be very different. And so all prices are not the same. And so I just, it, it's a cultural, we have to sh shift the norms and the beliefs. Yeah, yeah, we're with you on that. We believe that we have one important piece, but there's a lot of important things that need to happen. Again, thank you so much for being on. If you want to stay on for the next 10 minutes or so, you're welcome to. I do know it's a Saturday and you're busy, so if you drop off, we understand, but it's fantastic to have you on today. I'd like a little more about, learn a little more about what you're doing, so I'll stay on. Okay, okay, fantastic. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that's going to be happening uh, on Monday, we will be spending the day educating ourselves, getting ready to go on the Hill on Tuesday. We're a volunteer-based organization. So one of the things we'll be doing is showing seven videos that feature volunteers back home. They're three minutes long, each of them. We wanna share one of those with you right now. Uh, we know sometimes when we share uh, videos on this call, some people don't have ideal reception. It's not because the video is being transmitted, it's because there's sometimes a weak signal on your end. So if this isn't perfect, don't worry. We're gonna be releasing these to the public after we show them on our Monday Lobby Day. But I wanna just start with one of the volunteer stories that we'll be sharing over the course of our preparation for Lobby Day on Monday. science education teacher ambassador for climate change and I'm also the Dalton citizens climate lobby chapter leader <laughs> I got a lot going on I really really love the excitement level of middle schoolers I try to take and harness their energy for good we start by looking at very basic phenomena kids are capable of looking at a newspaper article and seeing hey why did Hurricane Harvey dump so much rain on Texas. And then we can do a lab in class with boiling water and I can say, what are the molecules doing? What are they doing when we heat up our earth? For the most part, my students are very interested in climate change and I can tell that they're nervous about it. And if I start talking about it here in my classroom, then students see how it's done and they're capable to do it themselves and maybe bring it up at home at the dinner table. In Northwest Georgia, it's very conservative and people here have really big hearts and they really care about their fellow man. They also really love the environment and they love our natural world. We're in the perfect location to be at the forefront of this new day in energy. We have a brand new solar manufacturing plant here in Dalton. So, our legislation is good for Northwest Georgia. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. My mom was a single mom. And so when I was given a gift, it was special. And that's how I teach my children with their things. I want you to take care of it. I see their beautiful faces and they talk about what they want to be when they grow up and they talk about where they want to live and every opportunity that I had, I want for them. My modern life would not be possible without the technological revolutions that we've had in the past. So I am grateful for what fossil fuels have done for me. At the same time, I can recognize that after you do something for a while and it's starting to cause harm, that maybe it's time to transition to something new. I got in CCL and I had no idea what I was doing. CCL really has given me the tools and has empowered me and has educated me to be able to take the steps that I need to take to protect the world for my kids and my students. To 
day at school, we got news that the football scrimmage has been canceled because the heat index is too high. It's not safe. And having a few of these days every now and then is normal. What isn't to be expected is to have the number of these days continually increase. How many times are my students not going to be able to go outside? We're not talking about some distant future. I'm talking about kids that are going to be during my career. Will they be able to go outside? Climate change is hard to look at. I'm not interested in turning away from ugly things. I will look the ugly things in the eye and say, we can fix this. Okay, so uh, one of the things you'll see in our monthly action this, this month is we're asking everybody to amplify our Giving Tuesday uh, day with uh, um, doing Facebook fundraisers. So as part of that, I asked Lene Pettengill, our development director, to talk about what's going to be happening on Giving Tuesday this year. Hey, everyone. I, I'm excited to announce <laughs> that our year in fundraiser is now active and that December 3rd, Giving Tuesday, will be our big formal public launch for this campaign, Benefiting Citizens Climate Education, the 501c3 tax-deductible sister organization to Citizens Climate Lobby. Our goal is to raise $500,000 or more by December 31st and $100,000 on Giving Tuesday alone. Now for you long timers, you might have noticed that this is actually less than our goal last year. That's because we have already brought in a lot of revenue through monthly donations. But we still need to make this $500,000 goal in order to ensure our volunteer training and support programs are fully funded. This year, <clears throat> we're hoping that each and every person within our robust nationwide network will make a donation to our year-end fundraiser. Whatever amount works well for you, we would love to have your participation. In addition, I hope you'll ask your friends and family to make a donation supporting our climate solution work. You could do this by creating a fundraiser for us on Facebook or by just sending out an email. Creating a Facebook fundraiser is a super easy process that only takes a few minutes to put together and share. Even Mark Reynolds is gonna do it. So that tells you a lot. And donations made through Facebook are tax deductible and will be directed to Citizens Climate Education. As some of you have never created a Facebook fundraiser before, I really wanna stress how easy it is to do. And Ashley Hunt Moderano will be walking you through the process in just a minute here. And also, this process is incredibly powerful as it can catalyze support. Facebook as a platform does a great job of helping you be successful by using its logarithms to increase the visibility of your fundraiser, and also by gently reminding folks that they've been invited to donate to your cause. Plus, Facebook covers all transaction fees, meaning 100% of each donation goes directly to the organization. For step-by-step -step information on how to create a Facebook fundraiser, please see the monthly action sheet. <clears throat> and just to put this in perspective, I gotta take a drink. <laughs> if a mere 1.5% of our network of more than 170,000 supporters were able to raise $200 each through Facebook, we would hit our goal of $500,000 with flying colors. If you don't wanna create a Facebook fundraiser or you're not on Facebook, no problem. Another option is to send out an email to your family and friends asking them to donate in support of our climate solution work. They could even donate in honor of your personal climate work. Please keep a lookout for more details about our fundraiser in the coming weeks. And thank you for any and all support you can provide here. Great, Lene, thank you so much. To show you how easy it is to do a Facebook fundraiser, Ashley is going to demonstrate how to do that right now. Hi, so I am CCL's Marketing and Events Manager and I manage our Facebook page. So I'm going to walk through um, very quickly how you can set up a fundraiser on your own Facebook page so that your community um, can contribute to the work that we're doing here. So what you'll do is you'll log into Facebook and what I'm showing you now is if you're doing it from a computer, if you try and set up a fundraiser from your phone, that's possible as well. It's just gonna look a little different. So you go to the top bar where it says your name and home and create, you click on create. And then at the very bottom here, it has a little heart icon and it says fundraiser. So click on that. And then you can see the middle option here says nonprofit. So we're gonna click on nonprofit. 
And right here, you can see Citizens Climate Lobby popped up to the top, probably because it knows it's my favorite organization, but that might not have happened for you. So if you would just type in a couple of letters of our name there, um, it will search the database and you'll be able to find us there. So I'll go ahead and select Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, and that's our name on Facebook, but as Lene mentioned, the money does go to Citizens Climate Education, um, which is our 501c3. Okay, so we've got the name listed there. Then we have our goal here. It sets it as a default for $200. I have a lot of friends that are really worried about climate change though, and I'm gonna try and stretch it out here. I'm gonna go for $1,000. Now, if I have a lot of people that get really excited about this fundraiser and I raise $1,000 really fast, I can come back and edit this and increase it to $1,500 if I wanna stretch my goal even more. Okay, so when is our fundraiser gonna end? We are gonna be running our end of year fundraiser through the end of the year, so I'm gonna change that to December 31st and then click next. Okay, so here um, I get to put the title of the fundraiser and it sets up uh, a default here with your name and then who the organization is. I'll just leave that for now. I'll come back later and edit this a little bit more. Um, and then down in this description, it says, why are you raising money? And there's a default as well here. So what you'll wanna do is maybe go back and put in why climate change is personally important to you and what CCL means to you. That way, whenever you share this with your friends, it's more personalized and um, they can hear your voice in it. Um, but it does explain who we are and what the work is that we're doing. And again, this is all something you can edit later. So you can do the fast way now and edit it later if you have more time. Okay, so and then here you pick a picture. I'll just leave this picture up for now, but if you have a picture of yourself from volunteering at a CCL event um, or maybe lobbying with your member of Congress, um, you can put that there and change that by clicking this little button here with the camera that says edit. So we'll go ahead and click create. And I'm pretty sure that was less than three minutes that it took me um, to go ahead and create this fundraiser. And there we go, congratulations. So the next steps are listed here that what you could do is invite your friends, you can share it in your newsfeed. And then of course, you can donate to your own fundraiser to kick it off. So um, go ahead and set up your fundraiser. And then those are the three suggested actions once you get that set up. And hopefully we can reach our goal just as quickly as Lene has set everything up for us. Okay, Ashley, thank you for that. So in addition to uh, supporting the, the uh, year-end appeal, we uh, have attached a tool for you to do a carbon calculator so you can see how you would come out under our bill in the US. In Canada, because the election just happened a few weeks ago, we're asking you to set up meetings in your provincial riding. So in Canada, if you would go ahead and set up meetings in your riding, that would be great. Um, I wanna just go over a couple of things real quick that happened since last month's call. There were 48 op-eds. That's a lot of op-eds. Great job, everybody, for getting a significant piece published in your paper. There are also a lot of energy uh, innovation and carbon dividend uh, in resolutions from municipalities, which includes Miami, Florida, Petaluma, California, Sarasota, Florida, Watsonville, California, Seaside, Georgia, Princeton, New Jersey, Stevens Point, Wisconsin, South Lake Tahoe, California, New Paltz Visage, New York, and the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. So I just love when that report came on my desk, you know, last month it was the Navajo, this week, it's, I mean, this month it's the Chippewas. That's just really, really great news. And also you added almost 20,000 people last month. So there are 173,804 people on our site who list themselves as supporters. So that's just a lot of really good uh, outreach work by everybody. Next month, Carolyn Wu will be on. We'll be very excited both to hear about her work with Catholic Relief Services and because she works so closely with the Vatican. Uh, and we'll be excited to hear about what she has to say about that. So Ricky's gonna unmute everybody if you wanna give a shout out. And if Dr. Hoffman is still on, if you can give a, a big thank you, that'd be great. We love having him on. We hope we can have him back. And maybe you can increase that chance by giving him a shout out as we unmute everybody's line. <laughs> Thank you.